Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome to this evening's study. And we're going to continue looking at A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner a little bit. And uh, I wanted to read some of this from uh, the 13 Crisis Years Appendix B uh, by Arthur L. White. But before we begin that, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful for the Sabbath that's coming and uh, for your presence in our lives. And we ask, Lord, that we can follow and serve you, that you can encourage us, we can uh, develop uh, good habits of prayer and study, uh, that we can contemplate the things of your creation and the things of your word that reveal your character and your love towards us and your ability and power to, to work in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that we can have the faith and confidence in you to trust that you can do this work that you promised to begin or that you promised to finish that you have begun in us. Um, we pray for one another and we ask, Lord, that as we study together this evening, and that your Holy Spirit can be our teacher. And we pray this and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening again. And it's not Sabbath here yet, but, you know, we'll be done before it's Sabbath here. But uh, I'm looking forward to Sabbath, a good day of rest after a long, hard week. Now, this topic here, of uh, Jones and Wagner, this is the studies that we've been doing on the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And this series of studies we started well, quite a long time ago. Um, when did we start that? It's, well, it's been, let me see how many videos. It's been about a year, somewhere around there. I can't remember when we started this series. This is, um, let me see. Well, I can figure it out. Uh, well, so this is study number 98. But oh, that's like two years, right? Almost. So this study number 99. So. Yeah, so we've been studying this for a couple of years. Uh, it doesn't so, seem like it. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it to me. But if I if I think about it, yeah, I can remember where I lived when we started studying this. So yeah, it just this doesn't seem right. But you know, there's 52 weeks in a year, and we this is study number 99. So I mean, once you get up to 104, that should be two years. We might have. I don't know if we missed any weeks. I think we might have missed one. Uh, during the camp meeting. So uh, it's hard to believe, but uh, I guess it's true. Okay. So this study we've been doing for a long time. The purpose of this study, I mean, initially we've had a lack of understanding in this movement or a lack of study, at least that's a complaint often made, about righteousness by faith. And and I remember the reason I started this study had to do with um, a sister in the movement who was presenting some stuff on righteousness by faith. I think that was part of it. I, I don't even remember all my exact reasons for this uh, study. And I'm just going to look here. Let me see when I first. So the first study was February 2nd, 2021. So we must have missed some weeks in there. No, that's, no, that's not true. We did We did some studies on... Ah, that's what happened. We did some studies in 2021, and then in 2022, we started these in August. So I'm not sure. How how do we have 98, 52, 104? I guess it kind of makes sense. Yeah, so August 19th was the first study in this series. We Okay, because we did this other thing on the three angels' messages. That's what I'm looking at. And then we have the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And those started August 19th, 2022. So that's not quite two years yet. So we, we, we had gone through a lot of material. Uh, we went through, uh, A.T. Jones 1893 General Conference Bulletin. We went through the 1895 General Conference Bulletin. And, uh, you know, as we've been studying through this, we've delved deeper and deeper into understanding righteousness by faith. And, what we did recently is we looked at E.J. Wagner's uh, deathbed confession and then Jones' presentation at the General Conference in 1909, uh, an appeal for evangelical Christianity. And we, we saw the differences between Jones and Wagner. Now, both of them left the church, but on different terms. They had they're very different individuals. 
Wagner definitely went in the direction of leaving the truths of Seventh-day Adventism. Jones didn't, but Jones still has his problems. And when we studied an appeal for evangelical Christianity, I really can't find fault with what he says. And I can't find that Ellen White makes a comment directly about it at all, right? There are comments that she makes about Jones prior to that and and in that period that Jones basically had lost his way. And and you're going to see that this this article by Arthur L. White is a little bit colored in, and and you, you should be able to see that in some of the word choices that he makes. Um, he's trying to be balanced and objective, but as we all know, if we, we all have enemies, people that don't like us, and if you have the right people, then, you know, there could be people that could write about me, people that could write about you, and say some pretty mean things, and color things in a way by not mentioning certain things or hinting at or alluding to uh, things, but not stating them directly, that can give an impression on the mind of the person reading, that there's all kinds of problems with that person, right? Because, you know, we don't know A.T. Jones person. We weren't there. We didn't experience any of this. This is all secondhand knowledge uh, about Jones when somebody else tells you about what he did and what other people thought and what kind of person he was. Now, we could look at what he wrote. and We can say, well, that what he presented, it, it seems solid. But there's things behind the scenes. And, and I think my my opinion in, in studying this in the past, and, and my opinion still, I think, is that Jones got caught up in the politics that was occurring around him. And I've done the same types of things in the past. And I'm not saying, you know, in, in the distant past, sometimes in the recent past. Uh, we can get caught in a trap. There can be a snare set for us. And we we can walk into it even though we know better. And and that is going to weaken our influence. And and it's a trap that Satan has set. And so we have to be very, very careful in what we do. One is that we always consult God in the decisions that we make. But there's times, you know, I knew I was walking into a trap, but I walked into it anyway. And, you know, I sometimes, you know, kick myself. But but sometimes those traps, they're they're very seductive. Right. That's why they're a trap. You know, like uh, if there's no cheese on on the mouse trap, the, the mouse isn't going to go into that trap. Right? But you put a bit of cheese on there. And even though he knows better that that cheese is seductive. And so that happens to us. And I think that happened with Jones, that there's certain aspects of our character that Satan knows how to use. And they're not even they're not even the worst aspects of our character. Sometimes they're actually Parts of our character that, that for the most part are, are, are just our, our personality. Uh, there's just things that, you know, sometimes th- those characteristics can be good in certain situations, but they can be weaknesses in other situations. So, for instance, you know, using myself as an example, I tend to be a peacemaker. I like to, to be a peacemaker. And that gets me caught sometimes because I end up in situations where there's nobody there interested in making peace. And yet I approach it with that naivety that I can somehow, you know, patch things up. And so, so that's gotten me in trouble. And, and there's lot, lots of, you can probably relate to, to these, to these things, how that there are things in your personality that, that you can get trapped by. So what we're going to look at is, is what Arthur L. White, his opinion, about what became of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. So <clears throat> he tells us Jones was born in April 26, 1850 in Ohio, Ohio, right? He was um, in the United States Army. He studied a lot of history and, uh, you know, so he was uneducated as far as, you know, official education is concerned. You know, he didn't have a formal education as a minister, uh, but he became an Adventist and then he became a minister. And then uh, he also became associate editor of the Signs of the Times in 1885. Now, E.J. Wagner was born in 1855, so five years younger, roughly, than Jones. So January 12th, 1855. And, and he went to Battle Creek College. 
and he received a classical education. We know him as Dr. Wagner because he took a medical course, right? So he studied at Bellevue Medical College in New York, and then he went to Battle Creek Sanitarium where he served as a doctor. But he wanted to be an evangelist. In 1883, he was called to assist his father, J.H. Wagner, who was the editor of the Signs of the Times, or was the editor of the Signs of the Times, May 6, 1886. Then it says, editor of the Signs of the Times, May 6, 1886, issue list E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones as associate editors. So they were associate editors of the Signs of the Time in 1886. So they, you know, they talk about their build, their appearance. Wagner was short. So this is A.W. Spalding wrote about them. He knew both of them. He says, Unlike as a garden of fruit and apples of the desert were these two, and yet they teamed together in close fellowship and cooperation. Young Wagner was not even like his father, tall and massive. He was short, stocky, somewhat diffident. Uh, Jones was a towering, angular man with a long, with a loping gait and uncouth posture and gestures. So here you see a little bit of, I don't know, to describe somebody with uncouth posturing and gestures. It's sort of a negative picture that he gives of Jones. Uh, Wagner was a product of the schools with a leontine head, well-packed with learning and with a savor, a tongue. Uh, Jones was largely self-taught, a convert found as a private in the United States Army. He was studied day and night to a massive of historical and biblical knowledge. Not only was he naturally abrupt, but he cultivated singularity of speech and manner, early discovering that it was an asset with his audiences. So, you know, you can see that uh, Spalding doesn't really have a good view of Wagner. Would you agree with me that, that the way that, or Jones, would you agree with me that he doesn't have a good impression of Jones, even though he knew him personally? We, we can see how somebody can describe an individual, like different people could describe, you know, you, each one of you, you know, differently. Different people who know you might describe you quite differently, not just in your looks, uh, but also in your personality. Was Jones naturally abrupt? I don't know. That's what uh, Spalding says, A.W. Spalding. But, uh, whether that's correct or not. And, and even then, what does that really mean about a person? We all have certain characteristics and aspects of how we communicate. Uh, sometimes people have, some people are more eloquent than others in their speech. Some people have better looks, you know, some people um, have better manners or different manners, or brought up in a different culture. So I don't know if any of this is really useful. Right. All I see that we, we have here is that this is meant to sort of give uh, the way that I see what's what's being written here so far is there's these defects in Wagner and Jones. And, and that that explains to some degree the direction that they went and some of the things that are going to be said about them here. It says here, the Minneapolis conference and its aftermath drew both Elder Jones and Elder Wagner into increasing prominence in the work of the church. God bless their ministry, and it was their privilege to lead a renewed emphasis on the basic Protestant doctrine, righteousness by faith. For many years, they were held in high esteem. Now, you see that renewed emphasis? We studied that before. So did Jones and Ed Wagner give a renewed emphasis on the basic Protestant doctrine of righteousness by faith? Was that what they presented? a renewed emphasis on this basic Protestant doctrine of righteousness by faith. We know when we studied the 1888, um, is it 1888 Reexamined? Is that the name of the book by um, Robert Wieland? He, he, I think he looked at this, this, these types of quotes. So we would have to say that what Jones and Wagner taught was not just a renewed emphasis on some basic Protestant doctrine, but it was light from heaven that brought insight that had never been seen before. Would we agree with that idea? That what they brought was something new. It wasn't just an emphasis, a renewed emphasis on something that was already understood. So you can see already here that lots of these things that we've looked at before regarding Jones and Wagner, uh, sort of painting them in an unsavory light and, and then weakening really what their work was. Well, this in a sense would seem to be, you know, they, they were good, right? They, 
they increase the prominence of the work in the church. But but if you look at what he's saying, it, it's really not recognizing the role that they had and, and the message that they gave. So then he goes on, and, and uh, Stephen had asked about this. I think it was Stephen. Maybe it was somebody else. Can't remember. Somebody asked. I don't think it was Stephen because he does not usually hear Friday night. Somebody asked about this, you know, Ellen White's statements about, it was Kelly Ross, that's who it was. Uh, Knowing well the peril of those who are used mightily of God and with a seeming premonition, Ellen White wrote in 1892. So they had asked about this statement. I think this is probably the statement they were thinking of. It is quite possible that Elder Jones or Wagner may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. But if they should be, this would not prove that they had had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. But should this happen, how many would take this position and enter into a fatal delusion because they are not under this, the control of the Spirit of God? The way uh, they walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire they have came, kindled and the light which God has given, and they walk in blindness as did the Jews. So who is it that... Walk, walk in the sparks of their own kindling. Like, do you understand the statement? Uh, okay, well, Iran says Adab and the Bayhu. But I'm talking here in this context of what Ellen White's saying. Yeah. So, so that cannot distinguish between the fire they kindle and the light which God has given. Right. So they walk in blindness. As did, so who is it that walks in blindness as did the Jews? Like, it's just, it would be, what is the fatal delusion? So people who take this position, that if Jones and Wagner fall away, that they had no message from God, that is the fatal delusion. And those who take that position walk in the sparks of their own kindling and cannot distinguish between the fire they have kindled, that is their own thinking, and the light which God has given. And they walk in blindness, as did the Jews. So Ellen White's giving this warning to people who say, well, if Jones and Wagner are overthrown by the temptations of the enemy, that those who take the position because they were overthrown, that they, their message was not of God, those people will be walking in the sparks of their own kingdom. They actually are under a fatal delusion. That is that what she's saying? That's how I take this paragraph. So lots of people would take this position, right? And people have. They've taken the position that Jones and Wagner were not really teaching the truth. They had some good ideas here and there, but really, you know, we, there isn't really truly a message from God. They weren't truly God's messengers. I know that this is the very position many would take if either of these men were to fall. And I pray that these men upon whom God has laid the burden of a solemn work may be able to give the trumpet a certain sound and honor God at every step and that their path at every step may grow brighter and brighter until the close of time. Jones, so then he goes on. So that was Ellen White, letter 24, 1892. And uh, Arthur White goes on. He says, Jones and Wagner, so highly honored of God because of their wide influence for good, became the special point of attack of the great adversary. Uh, the LNG White communications to both men through a 15 year period following 1888 revealed that each had weaknesses in his experience and each made mistakes. This, this however, did not disqualify them to do God's service. It is with regret that we record that both men lost their way. We shall review rather briefly the experience of the two men and then deal first in detail with Elder A.T. Jones. All that appears here is presented in kindness, but it is appropriate that a record of the facts be made available to all interested in the work of the church and in the experience of these two men at one time so influential in its work. So now I'm, I'm giving sort of my, my opinion of what I see going on here. So, Arthur White, he's going to be using Ellen White's quotes, and he's going to try to be judicious, or at least appear judicious. And even though he's read a statement of Ellen White that we, we, we wouldn't take that their message wasn't from God just because they were, they might fall away, in some ways he's going to actually be doing what Ellen White says. Now, Ellen White wrote lots of counsel to individuals. And in warning them of things that they were doing. And definitely Jones did not heed her counsel. And and one thing we will see is that Jones was overconfident in his ability to influence John Harvey Kellogg because there was a lot of politics going on at the time. So there was a conflict between uh, the ministerial work, the ministers, 
and the health work in, in this history. So there's a battle going on over uh, the Battle Creek Sanitarium. So it's an aptly named uh, place. And, and this battle, of course, is Kellogg's on one side and, and the church is on the other. Kellogg wants to control what he's doing and the church wants to control what he's doing. You know, when it comes to politics, politics is a very, it's a very dangerous thing. It's easy to get caught up. We see this, we saw this in our movement. Uh, we saw the politics involved with, you know, after July 18th, committee set up. People, people try to use committees and organization to make it look like they're doing things in a proper way, but they have things happening behind the scenes that aren't always seen. And of course, God sees them. But we can get caught up in those things. We can think that it's important, you know, that our voices are heard. And, and it's much easier just to tr trust that God's going to take care of things. So uh, in 1884, Elders Wagner and Jones met on April 26, 1886, as Elder J.H. Wagner, the father of E.J. Wagner, was released from his responsibilities as editors, editor of the Signs of the Times. E.J. Wagner and A.T. Jones were selected to serve jointly, and their names appeared jointly as editors for three years, from May 13, 1886 to May 6, 1889. So April 26, 1886, that's going to be A.T. Jones' uh, 36th birthday, right, because he's born April 26, 1850. So kind of interesting. The issue of May 6, 1889, lists E.J. Wagner as editor and A.T. Jones as special contributor. Elder Wagner then carried the work of editor until May 11, 1891, when the name of Elder M.C. Wilcox appears on the masthead. It will be observed that the two men held editorial responsibilities through the Minneapolis Conference and E.J. Wagner had for two and a half years beyond. Uh, through the 1890s, Elder A.T. Jones was much in Battle Creek. He attended all sessions of the General Conference from 1888 to 1905 and often presented important addresses. Ellen White had occasion on April 1893 to caution Elder Jones regarding extreme views in his presentations of the relation of faith and works. Okay, so they're going to give us selected messages to, to read there. Now, we read the 1893 General Conference uh, Bulletin and what Ellen White says about the 1893 General Conference. So, uh, in, and I just want to see, if I click on that, does it bring me to that page? Okay, interesting. Okay, this, this is interesting. I was attending a meeting and a large congregation were present. In my dream, you were presenting the subject of faith and the imputed righteousness of Christ by faith. You repeated several times that works amounted to nothing, that there were no conditions. The matter was presented in that light that I knew minds would be confused and would not receive the correct impression in reference to faith and works, and I decided to write to you. You state this matter too strongly. There are conditions to our receiving justification and sanctification and the righteousness of Christ. I know your meaning, but you leave a wrong impression upon many minds, for good works will not save even one soul, yet it is impossible for even one soul to be saved without good works. God saves us under a law that we must ask if we would receive, seek if we would find, and knock if we would have the door opened unto us. Uh, Christ offers himself as willing to save unto the uttermost all and to come to, unto him. Him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You look in reality upon these subjects as I do, yet you make these subjects through your expressions confusing to minds. And after you've expressed your mind radically in regard to works, when questions are asked you upon this very subject, it is not lying out uh, in so very clear lines in your own mind, and you cannot define the correct principles to other minds, and you are yourself unable to make your statements harmonize with your own principles and faith. Uh, the young man came to Jesus with the question, Good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Christ saith unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus quoted several. And the young man said unto him, All these things I have kept from my youth up. So we're familiar with this statement here. She says, here are conditions, and the Bible is full of conditions. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful and had great possessions, for he had great possessions. So when they put this in here, is it that he has, she cautioned Elder Jones regarding extreme views? Is that how you would characterize 
what Ellen White said. Was she cautioning Elder Jones regarding extreme views in his presentations of the relation of faith and works? Now, that, that is correct, but don't you see that this statement could give a different impression than when you read what Ellen White says to Jones? Because does Jones have extreme views, according to Ellen White? Did she say Jones has extreme views on the relation of faith and works? No, she just said uh, people might get the wrong idea. Yeah, so so you've made some strong statements, and, and you need to be careful, right? Because you and I see things the same way. But, you know, so, but you can see how this statement here, uh, cautioning Elder Jones regarding extreme views, is really misleading. You agree with me that that's misleading of what she actually said? It, appear, it would appear to be. Yeah. And I've had, I've had ministers and, and other people say to me, well, Ellen White says that Joan, Elder Jones had extreme views, referring to this, this statement from, uh, that, that's here. So they had read this and they would say, oh, Jones had extreme views in his understanding of righteousness by faith, right? But it was just, it wasn't extreme views. It was, he, he didn't present things. He presented things more extreme than they should be to try to make a point and that, that that could be misleading. Now, and then they're going to add in here about Anna Philip Rice Phillips. A few months later, and she wrote him a few months later to reprove him for giving wholehearted support to Anna Rice Phillips, who claimed the gift of prophecy. Now, I don't know if any of you know that story about Anna Rice Phillips, uh, but Jones is going to uh, present a sermon where he reads some spirit prophecy statements and some statements from Anna, Anna Rice Phillips. And he says, you know, see, we hear the same voice. And then he goes to get his mail and he has a letter from Ellen White. And Ellen White in this letter uh, describes what he had just presented and tells him that it is incorrect. And she's in Australia. So it takes a little while for the letter to get from Australia to the U.S., for Jones to read it. So Ellen White saw in vision what Jones presented before he presented it. And this, of course, struck A.T. Jones very powerfully. But they put this in here. Why? What is it that they're trying to do? They're trying to do the very thing that Ellen White says that we shouldn't do, right? right just they're trying, to, trying to discredit uh, Jones. Yeah, they're trying Jones, to discredit it. Jones' message. Yeah. And so, so they do this kind of, well, you know, Ellen White said this statement and, and, and they agree with it supposedly, but then they go and do really the very things that she, you know, there's these problems, these problems with A.T. Jones. And we've done that with other people. Other people have done it to us, you know, because we, we all have weaknesses. There's things that we've done or said that are stupid or wrong or, you know, things we may have said, you know, rashly and, in an outburst of, of self-defense or anger or something. And people will bring those things up again and again as if they are the main aspects of our character when they may be really just outliers. They don't really define who we are as individuals. So Jones was, I would say he was, you know, in supporting like Anna Rice Phillips, he was open to receive light, right? He, you know, so it's he was not a fanatical mind. But the idea here is going to give the impression Jones was just unstable, fanatical. And and, and then he says here, uh, Arthur L. White, um, from time to time, Ellen White counseled him to exercise caution, caution in his manner of speaking and writing so as afford, to avoid giving offense, right? And, and often when she's doing this, because she cares about the message that he's presenting, and she wants him to continue to have an influence in presenting this message. And, and he often listens to this counsel. And, and I've always tried to listen to the counsel in the spirit of prophecy in these regards. And, you know, I, and we should all do this when we read the spirit of prophecy. When she gives counsel to someone, we should say, do I do that? Is this counsel that, that I need to hear? I sort of identify quite a bit with Jones in, um, I've sometimes have said things unwisely and, and it has weakened my influence. And people sometimes have cautioned me the same sort of uh, cautions that Jones gets from Ellen White. So, so all of us have these weaknesses. So we're all different. We have different weaknesses. But this, this is the attack. This is the trap that is being set 
for A.T. Jones. Satan wants to weaken his influence. He takes some, some of the bad things of Jones' character, but also so some of the good things of Jones' character and uses it against him. In October 5th, 1897, he was elevated to the position of leading editor of the Review and Herald. It was announced that with this arrangement, Elder Jones, instead of speaking to comparatively, comparatively few of our people at any annual gatherings, he will address all of them every week. And this will give to our churches and scattered brethren everywhere the privilege of receiving each week the words of faith, hope, courage, and good cheer that have been a means of so much blessing to many over all all over both America and Europe. Uh, so that's wrote this about Jones again. Who is this? Who who's writing this? Yeah, who wrote this? Arthur L. White. Oh, but her son, right? No, grandson. Grandson. Oh, okay. Yeah, I can't remember. I'm trying to remember how that who's the dad is, but anyway, yeah. So it's the relative of Sister White. That's my understanding. Sure. Right. So. I know probably Dwight knows more about it this than, than I do. Uh, this arrangement continued on, until May 14th, 1901, when an adjustment was made and Elder Uriah Smith was returned to the position as editor in chief of the Review and Herald, and Brother Jones was freed for evangelistic work in the field. So at the general conference session held February 19th to March 8th, 1897 at College View, Nebraska, Jones was elected a member of the General Conference Committee. He served in this capacity until, in a most unusual action, he resigned sometime prior to the General Conference of 1901. Now, this is the General Conference where Ellen White's going to call for reorganization. Uh, concerning this, it should be noted that the sub subsequent to the General Conference session held in February 1899, efforts were made to right certain wrongs pointed out by the testimonies and it is reported uh, the efforts of the committee in this direction did not in every instance meet with that hearty cooperation that might be expected. This caused Elder Jones to lose sight of the dignity of his position to the extent of allowing, as the testimony says, an evil spirit to cast drops of gall into his words. And forgetting the warning given him of God, he pressed his brethren into hard places. When mildly reproved by the president of the general conference for his course and counseled to make the matter right with the brethren by apology, he resigned from the committee. So this is from a paper called a Statement Refuting Charges Made by A.T. Jones Against the Spirit of Prophecy and the Plan of Organization of the Seventh-day Adventist Denomination. So here you can see that this, and, and that's a pamphlet published May 1906 by the general conference committee. So you can see they're going back over things that happened in 1899, and those things are being held against him in 1906. So you understand what's happening, right? This is personalities, politics, things getting in the way. Jones obviously making a mistake, right? Seeing that people aren't following the counsel that Ellen White's giving regarding organization and or correcting some things that need to be corrected. He gets upset, right? That there, there's, this is sort of a, a fancy way of saying, you know, he got angry, right? And then he's mildly reproved by the president of the general conference for his course. Now, you can see there in the language, do you, do you, we weren't there. But do you think he was just mildly reproved? I mean, they're going to put mildly reproved there. So the president of the general conference only mildly reproved him. But Jones an evil spirit to cast drops of gall into his words, right? Which is true, right? Forgetting the warning given him of God, he pressed his brethren into hard places. So we, we know that this is, is true about Jones, but I don't know, you know, maybe he did mildly reprove Jones, but the fact that they have to say that is, this is political. You can see that the statements that are made, what's being said, what's not being said, the people have a bias and a perspective. And, and I'm not like trying to defend Jones here. I'm just saying we need to be, because we're learning from this in our own experience with others, right? That's what we're trying to do. And this, this, this is not just to know about something historically, what happened, but, but things that we can learn from, that we can recognize. And we need to recognize our own weaknesses and the traps that we can be caught in. And Jones is, is caught in a trap. 
And that trap has basically discredited Jones in many people's minds, right? So there's many people who have an impression of A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner that they've got from this type of material and also from, uh, you know, George R. Knight and, and other material about Jones and Wagner. Because if you can't attack the message, you attack the man. Okay. And, and Jones did have problems. So and Ellen White's going to give him some very hard counsel, which which he would also do with with all of us at, at different times in our lives. And she did also with the general conference president. And, you know, but yeah, we pick the, we pick the things that uh, we want to hear that fit in our agenda and the things that we uh, don't want to hear, we don't mention. Right. So it's 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 crafted in a way to give a certain impression. At the general conference session held in Battle Creek on April 1901, as presented in chapter 17 and 18 of this book here, uh, the work of the church was reorganized, which reorganization resulted in the drawing of a number of men to carry responsibilities. The field was divided into union conferences and provision was made for the organization of general conference departments. Jones was again elected to the general conference committee, a position which he held until the session of 1905. In the summer, summer of 1901, he was assigned to general work in the field and attended certain camp meetings. He took the position that we should have no kings, that is, we should not have conference presidents. This sentiment prevailed in the writing up of a new constitution at the General Conference of 1901. The remit was that a general conference committee was elected with the committee authorized to appoint a chairman and other officers A.T. Jones gave strong support to this plan. As he entered the field attending camp meetings in 1901, his work took him to the West Coast, first to the Pacific Northwest and then to California. At the California conference session in June, he was elected president and oddly enough, accepted the office. His harsh and domineering spirit soon cast him the confidence, cost him the confidence of many of those with whom he worked. Okay, so his harsh and domineering spirit. Now, can we take, should we take this with a grain of salt? Or should we believe that Joe Jones had a harsh and domineering spirit? In your experience, can people easily be seen as having a harsh and dominating spirit or domineering spirit that don't, that they can be cast in that light? Well, the way he, the way he explained things doesn't give me an impression that he had that, has that spirit. And that's because you agree with him. Well, the way he explains things when he's right. talking about righteousness by faith, it's the way he conducts himself. Yeah, but other people who would hear the same presentations that you that we read uh, would actually take him very differently. Yeah, and we probably have all experienced that—that that there are some people they're going to interpret in others things that are actually in themselves. They're going to see in others things that are actually in themselves. You know, and, and, and I've experienced this, I'm sure that you have too, that there are people who they, they can accuse you of something, but actually that's, that's something that's more in their character than your own. And vice versa, that sometimes there are things that I react to, I think that I see in others, and those are things that actually are representative in my own character. And that anytime you condemn someone, you really need to take a hard look at yourself. So whether Jones had a harsher domine- domineering spirit, I don't know. You know, I wasn't there, but I do know that people can be characterized in in lots of different ways by different people. Jeff experienced that. You know, some people really like Jeff. There's some people who who thought he was was terrible, right? They just had all kinds of negative things to say about him. And so, so I'm not so keen to just accept this sort of evaluation of an individual, especially when I don't see it in their writings. Now, I can see that Jones can be very straightforward and maybe not as diplomatic as he could be, but he is American after all. So I find that with a lot of Americans, no offense to Americans out there, but uh, definitely you're a bit different than, you know, the average Canadian, but there's always exceptions in both sides. So it's kind of a generalization. And then we look at people like Dwayne Dewey, who I really liked, but he could come across that way. But, you know, it wasn't just because somebody comes across as harsh and domineering doesn't mean they are. 
So I, I really have a hard time with somebody writing this, saying his harsh and domineering spirit uh, soon cost him the confidence of many of those with whom he worked. We don't know if that's really what was going on. So, so I'm reluctant to have an opinion about it. In the summer of 1903, at the time when affairs at the conference were most uncomfortable, he had an interview at Elms Haven with Ellen White in which he told her that at the request of Dr. J.H. Kellogg, he was planning to go to Battle Creek to teach Bible in the American Medical Missionary College. He hoped to be able to help Dr. Kellogg. She counseled him not to go. He promised Sister White that he would be guarded. She had been warned in vision that such a move on his part would lead to his downfall. She wrote of it thus. <clears throat> in vision, I had seen him, A.T. Jones, under the influence of Dr. Kellogg. Fine threads were being woven around him till he was being bound hand and foot. And in his mind and his senses, and his mind and his senses were becoming captivated. Now, what is it that uh, many of you don't really know the whole story? And we, we all don't know the whole story. But we, we know we have this conflict between Kellogg and the conference. And Kellogg was able to, to bring Jones over to his side. He was able to manipulate Jones. Jones here is trying to, to help Kellogg. He believes that he can help him. And Alan White says, no, this is going to be dangerous for you. But Jones doesn't heed that counsel. Then comments Ellen White, as she reported this to Robert Jones, just before he went to Battle Creek, she could see that his perceptions were becoming confused and that he did not believe the warning given. The enemy works in a strange, wonderful way to influence minds. But Jones was sure that he would not fall away. He was a man with too much self-confidence. And of course, that's not Ellen White's words. That's Arthur White's words. Now, was it too much self-confidence? Or was it naivety? Or, you know, maybe he, he just had confidence that God could use him. I don't know. But but the enemy works in a strange, wonderful way to influence human minds. And, and so I, here's where I would think that some of Jones' better qualities are going to be what Satan is going to take advantage of. His desire to help. Is it making sense what, what, what we're reading here and how, um, you know, how we're analyzing this? Yes. Okay. Good. And so it's, it's not just me. Okay. In 1905, still a member of the General Conference Committee, he was invited to assist in meeting some religious liberty crisis in Washington, D.C. But in two months, he was back in Battle Creek. Ellen White endeavored to draw Elder Jones away from Battle Creek into evangelistic work, and this would doubtless have saved the man. On February 26, 1905, she wrote, Elder A.T. Jones, God calls upon you to go out into the cities and give the last message of warning. Look to God for your support as you go. Call the people together, and you will certainly not work in vain. Let the truth go forth as a lamp that burneth. No longer confine your efforts to one place. Let there be held, let there be, be, let there be held right where you are, a solemn convocation. Let there be a renunciation of self to God. Hold fast the beginning of your faith unto the end. Let not your faith waver. Go forth in faith. There are those who have never heard the message of mercy and warning. And in the name of the Lord, I say, delay not. Proclaim the gospel message in the cities of America. Scatter the seeds of truth throughout these cities. Take with you reliable men who, with pen and voice, will act their part in proclaiming the message of present truth to the world. And then Arthur White goes on. Um, but he continued in Battle Creek under influences he was no match for. He was soon in bitter opposition to his brethren and to the spirit of prophecy. He issued a number of tracts and pamphlets in defending his course. Now, obviously, they're not showing us all these pamps, uh, tracts and pamphlets, but we have looked at some of these things in that history. So history, experience, and facts, and then, of course, the evangelical appeal for evangelical Christianity. So he's definitely in bitter opposition to his brethren. And I definitely believe that the influence that he had with Kellogg was one more of politics. That is, um, it's not so much that Jones got snared by uh, Kellogg's belief system, uh, his pantheism or things like that. But Jones got caught up in the politics that Kellogg was involved in. And this created opposition to his brethren. And, and, and so he got caught in the middle of this, is really what I think happened. And it, and it changed his perspective on how to work with others, you know, because when you see people 
being political, working behind the scenes to undo things that are being done, saying one thing and doing another. Uh, I think that really was Jones' downfall. I don't think it changed his ability to to understand the truth of the message, but it affected his ability to trust in God in the work that God was doing. And and so my view is he always sort of took the work into his own hands. That's the way that I I see what what Jones did. And and it, it is an easy trap to fall into when you see people doing wrong. And, and you believe that you are doing right to be in opposition to them. Arthur White goes on a number of enlightening statements made by Ellen White in communications to him, or in which reference is made to him between the time he joined, joined Dr. Kellogg in Battle Creek until her last message to him in 1911 are most revealing. There unfolds the picture of the progressive steps in the experience of a man. Self-confident, flaunting, warning messages, and deliberately placing himself under influences that finally captivated him and led to his spiritual destruction. Now, there follows in chronological order excerpts from several LNG White documents. Yep, somebody have a comment there? Now, I don't really want to read all these documents. And one is we don't have the whole context of them. And, and in some ways, you almost need the context. You need the background information. There was, so I'm just going to kind of skim over some of these. In July 23rd, 1904, 1904, Ellen White talks about an inharmonious note at the Barron Springs meeting. So the words and attitude of Brother uh, A.T. Jones at the uh, Brother Blank and A.T. Jones at the Barron Springs meeting in 1904 struck an inharmonious note, a note that was not inspired of God. It created a state of things which resulted in harm that they did not anticipate. Uh, it made the work of the meeting very much harder than it would otherwise have been. Had it not been for the, their injudicious course, the Baron Springs Conference would have shown very different results. Now, we have to be careful about those types of things, that in a situation where things are happening, we can think that our actions are going to result in something different than they do. And it's because we're not really counseling with God. We're not patient. We're not just trusting that God can take care of the situation. We think that we can fix things and we can't. And this is, this is the trap that Jones is getting caught in. Now, of course, they're giving us part of this quote, uh, of Ellen White. We don't know a lot of the details. What exactly happened? What was the inharmonious note? Who is this other brother that they don't name? Just Brother Blank and Brother A.T. Jones. I'm not sure why they don't include who the other brother was. Uh, this one from 1905. Uh, I send no more testimonies to be read to the Battle Creek Church to A.T. Jones, for I have evidence that a work will have to be done for him before the Lord will accept his service. God has given him warnings, which he has repudiated, and I'm deeply grieved that he has so little spiritual eyesight. And she's writing this to... Uh, uh, Brother Abaddon, he's the first elder of the Battle Creek Church. So definitely, Ellen White is saying that there's problems with Jones, that there's work that needs to be done, and that there's bitterness. Uh, you may be surprised to hear the words that you have heard from Elder A.T. Jones, but I'm not all, at all surprised. This is the development of the man, and the spirit that is counter to the spirit of God comes upon him, in him as he is at the present time. You have a representation of a man who is not under the molding influence of the spirit of God. The Lord accepts no such demonstrations of bitterness. So, and, and I saw this in lots of things that Jones wrote in that period. And even in an appeal for evangelical Christianity, uh, despite Jones uh, protestations to, to the contrary, um, I do believe that there was in Jones a spirit of bitterness and self-defense. And, and, and it's hard not there not to be. And the best thing that Jones could have done is left it alone. You can say, well, I need to tell the people what they did was wrong. But you may feel that you need to. You may feel that you need to reprove people and correct them when they're on a wrong course. But sometimes the best thing you can do is leave them alone. And one is you, you don't do yourself any good. You're just going to be disappointed that the message is not accepted. And I really think this is the problem that Jones had. And, and so he is bitter. And bitterness is not from God. 
But what we don't see in Jones is a rejection of the message as we saw in E.J. Wagner. Now, there's this other thing from uh, Letter 98, 1906. Read in my books, Patriarchs and Prophets in Great Controversy. The story of the first great apostasy history is being repeated and will be repeated. Read then and understand. So this letter, 1906, Farns, Farnsburg, Farnsworth and brother, sister, Ellen White, St. Helena. Clinton. So, so we don't have the letter. We just have the reference here. Uh, E.W. So, so letter 19 here. I'm just going to see letter 19, 98, 1906. I want to look this up. Because there they're not giving us much context. So let's see what this other. She wrote a lot of letters in 1906. Yes, yeah, brother and sister Farnsworth that she's writing to. Yeah, so this is where she talks about she's not surprised by Jones and he's bitter. Okay, I'm going to go look at this. We'll read this here, what she writes. I'd like to get the context. Okay, so she says, uh, I feel deep interest in you both. I hope that Brother Farnsworth will not leave Battle Creek just now. Let us say nothing to provoke men to anger, but ever present the affirmative of the truth by the truth. This is to be our position. I feel no surprise in regard to the course of Elder A.T. Jones. Last night, my mind was called upon many subjects. In the visions of the night, I was reading the scriptures, and the power and spirit of God was upon me. Many things were presented to me in vision, which I may give at the right time. I was saying with great power, thus saith the Lord, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in a day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee a covenant of the people to establish the earth, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages, that thou mayest say to the prisoners, go forth, and to them that are in darkness, show yourselves. They shall feed in the ways, and their pastures shall be in high places. They shall not hunger nor thirst, neither shall the heat nor the sun smite them, for he that hath mercy on them shall lead them. Even by the springs of waters shall he guide them. And I will make all my mountains away, and my highway shall be exalted. Behold, these shall come from far, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem, which is China. Um, sing, O heavens, and be joyful, O earth, and bring forth into singing, O mountains. Right. So she's going to quote all these passages. So I'm not going to read all of them. So then she says, hear and understand this matter. For you know the voice. The time is now short. We must remember that we are not to be conquered by discouragement. No power can conquer satanic agencies, but the power of him who gave his life to redeem man, dying in the sinner's place, that all who may repent and be converted. Christ is the propitiation for the sins of all who repent and believe in him as their personal savior. I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. Do you understand that it was the Lord, our Savior, who went through these scenes of humiliation? Hear ye and understand and let every soul take in the situation. Christ suffered all this that is written of him. Who prompted this cruel treatment? The one who was once the most exalted of the angels in the heavenly courts. He was imbuing human minds with his own attributes. It was Satan who led men to treat Christ thus. Right. I gave my back to the smiters, my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. I hid not my face from shame and spitting. For the Lord will help me. Therefore, I shall not be confounded. Therefore, I have set my face as a flint. And therefore, and, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. He is near that justifieth me. Who will contend with me? Let us stand together. Who is mine adversary? Let him come to me. Behold, the Lord God will help me. Who is he that shall condemn me? Lo, they shall wax old as a garment. The moth shall eat them up. So, you know, Christ here is showing his confidence in God in spite of what ha is happening around him. Right. So then she says uh, to brother and sister Farnsworth, uh, my brother and sister, be of good courage. Let your hearts be glad and rejoice. There's no need for us to complain. For the Lord is the strength of his people. You may be surprised to hear the words that you've heard from Elder A.T. Jones, but I'm not at all surprised. This is the development of the man when the spirit that is counter to the spirit of God comes upon him. In him, as he is in the present time, you have a re representation of a man who is not under the molding influence of the spirit of God. The Lord set, accepts no such demonstrations of bitterness. They do not become the man. And the Lord has been so gracious to him, helping him in the time of his distress. Read my books, Patriarchs and Prophets, and the Great Controversy, the story of the first great apostasy. History is being repeated and will be repeated. 
Read then and understand. The tra- time is drawing to a close when power of influence, of intellect, of knowledge in science can cover the least departure uh, from the Lord's way. He has pledged his word that he will humble every oppressor of his ministers or the appointed agencies engaged in his work. Persecuting powers will be brought into judgment for all the resources of heaven and earth are to be uh, are to be called at God's command to do his work. God sees and knows those who are proud and self-sufficient, and he will bring them into judgment. Before the flood, men cast off the fear of God and trampled underfoot his holy law, but judgment overtook them. Um, Thy wisdom and thy knowledge it hath perverted thee, and thou hast said in thine heart, I am, and there is none beside me. Say to our brethren and sisters who have known and understood the voice of God in his word, Let nothing interpose between you and your eternal interests. Think of this representation given of Christ in the scriptures. I have quoted. The Savior, in his supreme power, could have palsied the hands that smote and insulted him, challenging him, the prince of life, to prophesy. When men refuse the counsels of God and walk directly contrary to them, they make very strange speeches, but do not, but do not be the least concerned or surprised. The Lord is watching every movement. There are straight messages to be given. And in no case are we to fear the face of men. If Christ endured so much, cannot we endure something for his sake? Who was he? The Prince of Heaven. Unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father. Mighty God, twice there. Uh, The Prince of Peace. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. These words outline our appointed work, and we are now to engage in this work as never before. Soul saving is to be our object. Christ's words are our commission. And we are to lay hold of the Savior by faith and put all our capabilities to the task of learning the science of soul saving. Fields that have been neglected call now for repentance on the part of those who have heard the truth. They call upon them to make their appointed work. So we can see that these statements that we have, that Arthur White is uh, quoting, that there is a context. And what would that context be? What is it that we, we see that Jones is bitter, but he is also being opposed, right? And he's bitter because he, he's demonstrating his bitterness. And Alan White's saying, that's not of God to do that. So when it says, read in my books, Patriarchs and Prophets and Great Controversy, the story of the great apostasy, history is being repeated and will be repeated. Read then and understand. Is she talking about Jones or is she talking about what's happening in the church? I know I read through it rather quickly. So is she applying this to Jones personally, that history is being repeated and will be repeated? Or is she talking about this in a, in a larger context of what's happening in the church that Jones is reacting to and becoming bitter about. What's, what's your opinion? Anybody? Or well, you I not? think she's talking to the church and Jones because had Jones followed her, her counsel, a lot of this, this trouble. Yeah, 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 this yeah. But what I'm saying is this is not directly like attacking Jones only. Like there is something going on. Jones is caught up in it. It, do, it doesn't matter which side you are on in, in this sort of situation. Both situations are bad. So we can look at the church in apostasy, right? We can see what's happening in the church. But if we get caught up in the wrong spirit, we've, we've fallen for the trap. And, and Jones fell for the trap because he believed that this work was going to be accomplished. And it wasn't being accomplished. The councils were not being followed. And so when counsel came to him to basically leave it alone, he didn't listen to that counsel. He thought he could fix it. He took the work into his own hands and, and messed it up big time. That's, that's the way that I see it. Okay. So I'm going to stop there for today and we'll come back to this next week. Any final thoughts before we close with prayer? So let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you for the study this evening, and we thank you for the Sabbath. We ask for your blessings, that you can continue to work in our lives. And we pray, Lord, that um, you can bless the meetings tomorrow. Uh, We ask for your guidance 
in all things. We pray for one another. We know, Lord, that there are things in our characters that have been manifest that have not reflected the character of Christ. And we ask for forgiveness and that you can help us to learn from our mistakes and the mistakes of others. Continue to be with us on the Sabbath. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.